Thanks. I like Layla a lot too, but I never interpret it that way. Yeah, Ben, what uh, Ben's trying to tell us is that he thinks Layla is equivalent to like guitar masturbation or something. I mean, I Hello everybody and welcome back to another episode of The Walk Round Table hosted by yours truly, me, Chris Bartgorn. And before we begin, I would like to prompt everyone to like and subscribe. Um, today we actually have another panelist more than what we usually have had up to this point. So we have, uh, of course, in addition to me, we have Ben. Hello. And of course we have Matthew. And, and of course now... Um, we also have a new, a new panelist, which is Zach, who is Purify, or at Purify underscore guitar on YouTube. Hey, what's up? Hey. So, um, today we are going to be discussing the best guitarists, the greatest guitarists of all time. Now, of course, there are a lot of guitarists out there. Every band basically has to have one, um, at least every rock band. And, um... So I'm sure there will be stuff we don't get around to. People who have done great walks, they've put out great guitar walk and songs, maybe not always the most famous songs. Um, but we will be discussing all favorite, at least, guitarists, and who we think the best guitarists are. And we will be talking about, you know, what we think their best walk is, and how they are compared to each other. Um, so, yeah, let's get to it. Um, first off, I want to start with you, Matthew, because I know you have a lot of thoughts on um, the best guitarist. So, uh, who do you think is the best guitarist? I mean, it's pretty an easy answer to be who the best guitarist is, and that is, one, Jimi Hendrix, enough said. Um, basically, he is the guitarist of all guitarists. Everyone is some way usually the greatest some of the greatest guitarists of all time they usually say well i got inspired by Jimi hendrix um jimmy hendrix is like one of my greatest musical heroes and yeah what can i say it's Jimi hendrix yeah well Jimi hendrix obviously has despite only a relatively small discography in terms of albums he has a great number of um songs where he puts out a great amount of like flashy and very impressive and oftentimes just overall milestones for the rock guitar and um you know even if you just look at uh the Jimi Hendrix experience's first album all you experience you have you know Purple Haze you have Level Confusion you have Wind Cries Mary you have Fire you have Fjordstone from the Sun you have all you experience all those songs have great guitar work and that's not even getting into Axis Bold as Love or Electric Ladyland, or any of the live stuff, or any of the unreleased stuff, every time his death, just even just one album, it's one of the greatest guitar albums, honestly, of all time. Ben, what are your thoughts on Jimi Hendrix? Yeah, Jimi Hendrix is a very impressive guitarist. Um, I think a particular note is his uh, work at Woodstock, um, especially being the I don't know if I would say it's the only good version of the Star Spangled Banner. But the Star Spangled Banner is a very difficult song. It's a kind of a weird song to have as a national anthem just because of how it's probably being laid over a drinking song. Um, how weird it is, especially vocally, do And uh, just the wording and stuff is more appropriate for a poem and stuff. Obviously, Jimi Hendrix's guitar-only version of it doesn't have the lyrics, but in some ways it does capture the intonation of how the lyrics flow, not just the bass musical setting of it, but like how the flowing of the words on top of the level of just the pure notes is. I don't know exactly but what's causing it, but there's a certain flowing of it that matches how an ideal, I guess, version of it would be. And the builds on top of that with its distortions and stuff to allow for a very rich sound. Yes. Well, Hendrix um, could really make the guitar talk. You saw it already, of course, on Fjord Stone from the Sun. But he really did make it walk with um, his version of Soul Spangled Banner as well. You can really hear the lyrics if you know the lyrics to the song in it. And even if you don't know the lyrics to the song, I think you'd still be able to at least hear something in it that sounds almost lyrical, despite it not actually having lyrics. And also the way he makes the 
there was sort of more kind of uh, militaristic bomb type sounds and whatever was a commentary on Vietnam. That's also very impressive. Um, and yeah, it's all obviously I think everyone considers it kind of one of the greatest live guitar performances of all time and for good reason. Yeah, I mean, and like he doesn't strictly, in some ways, he doesn't strictly play it. It's not a rote playing of it. In all places where he extends notes in ways that are not usual, um, or he, you know, plays around with it a little bit. Oh, yeah, he's but so in some ways, that does actually help show it better. And I'm, I mean, Zach is probably well. Zach is definitely a more qualified person to discuss the mechanics of that than I can. Uh, but I think it's interesting because he does. He's not doing just like a rote. I'm gonna hit this this chord and this chord and this chord and this chord and this chord that is in the I- ideal, I guess, version of it. It is more creative than that, and in some ways, it makes the sound better, but at the same time, also then reflects that ideal version in it that most people cannot sing very well because it's a weird thing to sing. Okay, um, Zach, what are your thoughts? I mean, Jimi Hendrix is obviously has to be on the list. He's at least top five. Um, I have guitar players I like better than him, but he has to be on the list purely because of his influence and how pretty much everyone who came afterwards is inspired by him no matter whether they knew, know it or not. Yeah. And just stuff about like how he could make the guitar sing, how he could make talk and, and like the Star Spangled Banner. It's all about the feel of what you're playing and like the different kinds of bends or harmonics that you do. And he revolutionized that and with people like Eddie Van Halen, who I'm sure that we're going to talk about later on, um, their style and their unique style was all because of Hendrix. Yeah, and I yeah. would like to say that, um, and Zach obviously said that everyone who's come after Hendrix has been greatly inspired by him. Um, some of Hendrix's contemporaries were also greatly inspired by him, people like Eric Clapton and so on also saw a great deal of influence from Jimi Hendrix. And he's a well-liked and considered a favorite guitarist of many people, including contemporaries like Paul McCartney, who is obviously primarily a bassist, not a guitarist, but somebody who is contemporaneous and a little bit before Jimi Hendrix, as well as younger people and newer guitarists from, you know, the 90s, 2000s, train tens, etc. So he has a very broad-reaching influence, despite dying so young and, honestly, his studio discography and honestly live discography both being relatively short because of that i would say that my favorite hendrix guitar parts are in purple haze of course you know his quite possibly the greatest cover of a song of all time um all around the watchtower which was so good that even bob dylan the original uh doer of that song whenever he plays th- that all along the watchtower he plays basically the Jimi Hendrix version of it and also his I believe the greatest rendition of the Star Spangled Banner of all time yeah um I don't know if I mentioned this but me and Ben um have visited the Bob Dylan Center in Tulsa Oklahoma that has a bunch of Bob Dylan um kind of personal collection items and related sort of museum pieces and there was stuff in there that's related to the Jimi Hendrix version of All Along Watchtower, including a note that I think it was that Bob Dylan had sent Hendrix saying about how he liked his version and how he thought it was a really great version and that he even liked it better than his own. Zach, um, I think it's your turn. Who do you want to list off for who you think is one of the greatest guitarists of all time? Alright, I'm going to choose my favorite guitarist in this position. Um... I am a rhythm guitarist, and I do I love riffs more than I love solos. And while solos can make the guitar talk, all songs are based on a riff. And in my opinion, there is no person who has written riffs and plays riffs better than James Hatfield for Metallica. 
it's probably not surprising if you know me that I would pick James Hetfield, but his precision when he's playing the refs, his technique is unmatched. And the only person I can think that is on his level is Black Sabbath's Tony Iommi. But um, James, obviously with his down picking, you listen to a song like Creeping Death, and that's all down picking. I've tried it. It's a 200 BPM song, and there's no upshirts in it in the main riff at all. It's so hard to play that my wrist is throbbing after I play it one time. And then there's songs like Battery where he has the really fast triplets in the middle of the riff that people who have been playing the guitar for years still have trouble playing that song. It's just so precise. And while he is a rhythm player and while everyone considers him, no one thinks of him for his solos, he can solo pretty well and he can solo melodically. Very melodically. Um, if you listen to a song like The Outlaw Torn, the last like two minutes of the song are a solo from Hetfield. And it's one of my favorite guitar solos of all time. Um, it almost sounds like a riff. It's just, it's just, so it's just beautiful. It's just a beautiful solo. I don't know if any, if anyone else here has listened to it, but you should definitely listen to it. And then there's also songs like Suicide and Redemption where he shreds and stuff. But, I love Hetfield because of the riffs, and whenever I sit down and try to write riffs for myself, I always find myself emulating Hetfield. Yes, well, certainly I'm not, like, obviously the biggest Metallica listener. I think the only one of the albums I've listened to all the way through is Master of Puppets. But I found, you know, obviously in that album you have um, these very long, at times, instrumental sections, and even the parts that have vocals from what I could tell were well, in a lot of cases sort of downplayed in comparison to the instrumentation and you have these very long, very drawn out um, but also quite dense but also been quite at times very up-tempo moving very quickly instrumental sections and you know I mean honestly like I don't play guitar but I must imagine to play throughout something like that especially live it would be, I'm sure, quite a feat to just continue on and on and on with that same level of, you know, obviously Zach was talking about beats per minute, and at that kind of level of vigorousness, that sort of kind of, and with such an edge to it, you know? So I, I think that is quite impressive, personally. And going back to the songs for Master of Puppets, Master of Puppets itself is, I think, about nine minutes long. And it's the fastest Metallica song and there are people who've been playing the guitar for like over 10 years that are like, I can't play the song all the way through. It's too fast and it requires so much precision. Yeah, well, I just found a lot of that album had a lot of um, impressive, uh, impressive instrument work from everyone, um, including Hetfield, of course, but also including the others. Um, as I said, I, I honestly probably need to go listen to it again and some more of Metallica stuff because I am kind of a Metallica, um, I guess, uh, not an export, but I did like that album. I wasn't the biggest fan, I guess, of like the vocal style on it, but as I said, oftentimes that felt, at least to me, downplayed in comparison to this more of the sound of the instrumentation. Really, the feeling and the meaning was conveyed. In a lot of cases, uh, even on songs that have pretty strong themes like Disposable Heroes, uh, through like the instrumentation, you know? Yeah, Disposable Heroes is another one where it's so, it's just so hard to play. So, Hetfield, I mean, the fact that he can go up there and play, play those songs live for two hours a night is, it's just crazy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, certainly. Um, it's a lot more even demanding than a lot of guitar work, even for these people who do these long concerts uh, that aren't metal, you know. They aren't doing it quite at the same, you know, level of vigorousness as, you know, somebody like Hetfield is. Um, all right, Ben, it's your turn. Who do you want to list off? Um... 
I think in some ways that you have the two greatest guitarists, or as Matthew said, Hendrix and then Clapton, which is not to insult James Hetfield's impressive playing on some of these fast songs. Um, uh, since we already talked about Hendrix, uh, I guess I'll start discussing Clapton, though I think we will probably get back to him later. Um, but I think in some ways he ignoring all his personal problems, and I know there's quite a bit, did some very impressive work with Cream in particular, or with Dark and the Dominoes, that in some ways has allowed the guitar to take up a role that was equivalent with the vocals in some of these songs, or even superior to that, that was not... I'm not going to say that they'll want songs with important guitar parts because there were before that, obviously, like with the Beatles or with Chuck Berry. But in some ways, the guitar becomes the defining instrument in parts of like White Room and stuff. I would say, especially after the second um, dance of White Room, when it transitions, I would say that there's almost a novel stanza after that. A stanza that is at the end, but is equivalent, I guess, to the parts that Jack Boost is doing, but it's just done by Captain's guitar. But Captain's guitar is playing the same role as those vocals were the other parts of that song at the end. With a, a, a wah wah pedal. Um. Allowing it to reach that level of um, sound, that pitch and stuff, um, that is allowing the guitar to play not the guitars at that time. Now, obviously, we're talking about a long time ago. At that time, the traditional role in rock and world music. But instead to play the voices musical role. I think is quite an impressive feat at that time. I also think him and also Dwayne Allman, uh, his work on Layla is quite impressive. Um, especially kind of the sexually frustrated, and I know that's kind of a weird thing to say, but very frustrated, kind of up and down. Is I conveys I think very accurately in some ways more of the lyrics of Layla the feelings of that section of the song that like I mean he's talking about his frustration and that he wants all to ease his foolish mind and whatnot but the real emotional. The stress, the emotional um, turmoil, I think is conveyed best by. Bum, 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 bum. Yeah, um, Eric Clapton has never really like, been um, that great of a, I guess, vocalist. Um, a lot of his skill does. It's not. I'm not saying he's a bad vocalist, but sometimes he has had some problems with his voice being a little weak in places. Uh, albeit a lot of that was kind of afterwards and so to some degree he kind of has to let the guitar do the talking for him even when he's singing yeah I mean in some ways I do think he has the good vocals on later and stuff but I think yeah, in some ways it's all vocal performances to be sure the intersection of uh, almost you know sexualized almost o orgasm orgasm like <laughs> guitar parts that are not not in a joyous way like it exists in other songs but in a frustrated way kind of a pulsing of hormones more than the actual <laughs> thing. I like Layla a lot too but I never interpret it that way yeah Ben what uh, Ben's trying to tell us is that he thinks Layla is equivalent to like guitar masturbation or something I mean, I don't think it's, like, literally that. I think it's more of the impulse towards that, in some ways, that it's being... It's, it's like the... It, it, it's, like, not... It's not actually that, but it's, like, the... Kind of the, just the turmoil part. Like, he's singing an emotional turmoil, but I think the turmoil and it's, like, aggression and it's, like, conveyed 
in the intersection between Captain's explosions of guitar and bits of it intersected with the more bubbling, more boiling, more simmering walk by all men on it. Um, and to briefly stay off of Captain, I think Almond's walk alongside the piano on the second part of Layla, where um, well, it intersects and interacts with that piano. I also think does it excellent work because it transitions. And I know that those compositions were initially separate, but I think they work well together in communicating with, through the guitar connection. Um, the movements from all this really aggressive, very sexual em uh, energy and emotion in the first part to the more sublimated, um, more expansive, more transcendental um, piano part where the motions transition into kind of this sadness and wistfulness which is conveyed in the lyrics in the first part but is so combined with the sexual energy that it is um discordant in a good way um but it transitions and ascends into the transcendental loneliness and uh, wistfulness of the second half through, yes, the piano part, but also more importantly through the connection that Brian Allen's guitar does on that, in my opinion. And I know that this is not like a very technical discussion of what's going on in that song, and more of a alt critic, I guess, way of understanding it, but that's my understanding of it. All right. Um, I want to ask uh, Zach if you want to respond to any of that stuff about Layla. Or oh, if Matthew has anything to say about Layla Evil, because there's some more stuff I want to say about Clapton, but since we're talking about Layla right now, I don't really have more to say, particularly about that specific song. So if one of you wants to say something specifically about Layla, please go ahead and do so first. Yeah, Layla has one of my favorite riffs of all time, and it's just the, the emotion of that song, it just shows how much, be, how much guitar is dependent on feel. And how you feel when you're playing the guitar, how what what your emotions are, because the guitar in Layla is like a very sounds very like longing, I guess it sounds very lonely, and it's just it's a very beautiful riff. And disregarding everything about Clapton that is problematic or whatever, he's definitely he's definitely uh, legendary. Yeah. Um, and a lot of what Zach said about the longing of the guitar, you can really hear on songs like Bell Bottom Blues, uh, as well. I just want to say that's also, I think, a really good song. Uh, in terms of guitar, it's also one of Clapton's, uh, best vocal tracks as well, although that's not really super relevant to what we're saying. But, um, I think that's a good example of kind of the similar emotions in the guitar as what you had on, um... Lilo, though, a bit less, you know, it's a bit more m mopey, I guess, in some ways, as opposed to Layla's a bit more on the angrier side of longing, you know? Um, something else I want to say is one of my favorite, um, guitar, I guess, albums, and specifically sides of an LP, is side two of Fresh Cream. Um, Clapton did a lot of great stuff, especially on the songs Cat Squall, Wallin' and Tumblin', and I'm So Glad. Um... He kind of has a very nice blues rock sort of groove throughout. He's able to go for kind of a bit harder, a bit softer. And he also gets some really good interplay going on there with uh, Jack Bruce's harmonica. That sounds really great. I really do think, um, in some ways, Slide 2 is one of the best um, slides of a record ever put out for guitar. Um, only really in competition, I guess, with all you experienced in that regard. Um... Side 1 has pretty good guitar as well on uh, Fresh Cream, but it's n even better on Side 2. It feels like it takes a much more starring role, and especially the interplay between it and the harmonica throughout Side 2 is just great. Um, and of course you do have solos and stuff as well, but really these long kind of rolling instrumental parts will 
it's going really, really fast, the guitar, but the harmonica's keeping up with it, and they're both going kind of together on the same melody together, but, you know, it's a very fast, very kind of ambunctious sounding, um, kind of music to it. Really is, I think, quite impressive display of technical skill by both Clapton and Jack Bruce. Um, and I do think that is some of the most, I guess, exciting guitar work uh, on probably evil side of Layla that Clapton has ever done on those songs. Um, um, I don't know if anyone else has anything to say about that. Um, uh, thinking about Bill Bond Blues, which I know is going back a tiny bit, in some ways, I think the there's like a wistfulness in Layla. There's like this wistful loneliness and stuff that is a stream. And there's not the angle in Layla itself isn't aimed at Layla, the the character, or at at the person. Uh, but aimed at in some ways himself. himself. And it is also like a like a sexual anxiety and stuff all kind of intertwined in a way so there's the, the loneliness i think more of a loneliness in the guitar sound to my understanding is more almond's bed than captain's but um in bill bomb blues yeah it is just kind of this sadness or just in some ways a desperation of like not not ending, of not not fading away, which is not literal in that case, in the sense of he's like, he'll move on, but he'll that it's like the, the stuff is slipping away, well in Layla it's more all kind of just piling together, um, and I think that is an interesting contrast of how the guitar can do just one guitar with the same band on the same record, on similar topics, that can still do kind of really different things in, from an autistic standpoint and convey different meanings huh, between those two songs. Yes, well, Clapton also is able, obviously, to do um, some also softer sounding things, although it's not really as apparent with Cream and with, uh, what is on some Cream songs and with, uh, Layla, but he, on his solo album So Hand, he managed to do some really good stuff in terms of softer sort of sounds with his songs, of course, Wonderful Tonight, which is, I guess, kind of the happy ending to Layla, kind of, and Peaches and Diesel, which is the ending, um, instrumental that kind of recalls back Wonderful Tonight, and that is a novel song, I think, where he really makes the guitar talk, but he makes it talk in almost a ballad way as opposed to rock and roll way. It's almost a, like the guitar is waiting out a, you know, kind of saccharine ballad as opposed to just, um, you know, like really hard rock lyrics that are like really angry and whatever. And I think that is to some degree impressive as well. The song, once again, Peaches and Diesel, the last song on Slow Hand, because, you know, we were talking about the Stole Spangled Banner, in which, you know, you had Hendrix's guitar singing, um, these kind of singing, these kind of more epic, I guess, patriotic sounding lyrics, even if there's a little bit of irony in it, and, um, we talked about how the guitar kind of sings on Layla with this sexual frustration, but on Peaches and Diesel, it sings kind of a contentment, a song that's really quite soft and um, pretty soft for an electric guitar to be the main instrument, but it manages to work, I think, quite well. And it, as I said, it recalls Wonderful Tonight, which actually does have a flow like some older on in the album, and it really does um, manage to convey a sort of peaceful feeling without being boring or dull, but while still also, then also still having an electric guitar as the main instrument, and I think that's uh, quite impressive personally, at least. Oh. Yeah, I mean, and I also think we should, I mean, on while my guitar gently weeps as well, well, grief is also still quite good. Um, uh, oh, excellent. And, and, well, basically, the best guitar song, in my opinion, of, of the Beatles. 
I feel like that was kind of an oddly Matthew way of saying that. I don't know why. <laughs> yeah, well, it sounded Clapton, like it was like Matthew talking out of me. Clapton, I don't know why. Clapton and George both get to do good, some great stuff with the guitar in that song, and even at some points, I think John is also on guitar in that song, and he he does some good work too. Although I think that's mostly towards the end. Yeah, I mean, I think John's explosion, where he was more on guitar, is mostly, to my understanding, was overdone with Captain. It was just a little bit of John on the top, but there was something. Yeah. Um, and I also want to give a shout out to Sea of Joy from Blind Faith. It's also a really great guitar song, which Clapton, Clapton um, really does the guitar heroics. Um, it maybe has a bit less meaning in some ways than some of these other songs, but it is a really great guitar song as well. All right, are we done with Clapton for now, or does anyone want to say anything else? Well, that's mainly because this is going to be a shocker. I don't, I haven't listened to that much Eric Clapton, but I'm working on that. That's unfortunate to hear. All right, well, I guess it's my turn to list off a guitarist I really like. Um, obviously, we've already done Clapton, who I was going to do actually first. Um, and of course we've already done Hendrix as well, so I'm going to go a little bit out here, and I'm going to list off Neil Young as mine. Um, Neil Young has done some good, great guitar work, sometimes with other people, sometimes on his own. One of the best guitar albums as well, obviously I've mentioned to some degree the best guitar albums, um, is... Uh, Everybody Knows This Is Nowhere, the second Neil Young solo album from 1969, um, in which him and a guy named Danny Whitten, uh, may he rest in peace, did great work on Down By The River and Calgary On The Sand. Um, Down By The River in particular has a very kind of foreboding, kind of um, tense feel throughout with its guitar work. It's not flashy exactly guitar walk. It's kind of lumbering, kind of in a metal sort of way, I guess. Um, kind of proto-metal, I guess. It's still a little bit before, not by a huge amount. Um, and it really is uh, one of the kind of great guitar, kind of lumbering riffs of all time. It's never this like flashy Hendrix-esque thing. It's always this kind of you know, it's going on, you know, it's going on, it's walking on, but it's a bit unstable, it's a bit kind of wobbly in some places, it doesn't, you know, there's a little bit of a threatening edge to it, without, you know, it doesn't stop, and it never really quite breaks out into, like, a full attack, but it always feels like it could attack at, like, any moment, it's this very threatening sort of sound to it, you know what I mean? Um... And, uh, I don't know what's your all thoughts on the song, but I think it's, of course, one of the great guitar songs of all time. Um, anyone else have any thoughts on Down By Forever before I go on to the next Neil Young songs I want to talk about? I like the guitar on that, and... Yeah, yeah, I think that that's a good guitar song, um, in terms of its kind of density and its, um, its conveyance, kind of like in... They love but we think more of an edge of a sort of restfulness and in some ways is at an interesting point counterpoint with the lyrics in the sense of let's convey the restfulness, but there's also uh there's something else there. Well, the way I've um, always taken the guitar walk, I guess, on um down by the river to be is as I said it's got kind of a threat to it, but it's never in a quite an attack. It's like, you know, you're talking to this person, and they're telling you some of these disturbing things that they've done. They are, they seem threatening. They're not actively threatening you, though. But they're saying things that makes it quite clear that they're a very dangerous person, you know. And that they could just snap at any moment and do something very violent or disturbing. But they, they never uh, quite do it. There's always some sort of ongoing sort of, I guess, you know, it continues on. It it sometimes, it feels tense, but it's never quite out there in terms of, you know, a guitar attack. It's always 
continues on, kind of continues lumbling on, but it feels like it could, you know, kind of fall off at any moment and go into something much more dramatic, but it never does, and it keeps this very kind of tension throughout the song. I mean, I think in that's true kind of in the solo and in the chorus, but I think in large chunks of the song, it's more kind of this... It, it, it has this kind of restful note that mixed with this kind of like that has this, it keeps this country kind of sounding feel doing parts of it that kind of disarms it doing parts and then it goes then it will, it will grow up in tempo and intensity up in the chorus or in that solo it gets very dense and distorted. It's, well, that's what it's supposed to be. It's sort of supposed to be. You're right. It's, it's like this. It's been, it is supposed to sound country at times and kind of a bit because it's supposed to be something about, I guess, in some ways, the threatening and the mundane. It's supposed to be, to some degree, the um, every detail. It's supposed to be the sort of the uncanny valley. Um, guitar, I guess, to some degree. It's supposed to invoke that to some degree. It's like, there's this guy, and he's, you know, seems like a nice guy, you know, but he's, you know, saying some things that sound off, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable being around him because of some of the stuff he's saying, you know. He seems just fine, you know, he's acting just fine, he's acting just calm, he's maybe a little annoyed, but he doesn't seem, like, he's not acting out, really, that much. He's not screaming or yelling or anything like that. But yeah. but there's a sense of foreboding about him. He could do anything or he could do it again at any moment. It's uh, very kind of it was just something a bit you know, a sense of kind of, you know pins and needles of very like he's not doing anything. He's not breaking down actually within the song. He's going on. He doesn't really seem that angry, just maybe mildly annoyed, and um, but it feels like it's just a little bit it's a little bit rough waters, you know that you're selling on, that it could, maybe the situation something could happen very suddenly and it could go south very quickly and there's just something a little bit off about the situation yeah, I mean, I think in some ways, I think it's not a it's not it's always maybe this is a more accurate portrayal of how some of these things go. Um, it's a kind of a mass. It's a very almost. It's not. It's not detached from emotion altogether. It is detached from the emotion that is the defining one, which is anger. It's for, for the, much of it, it's which for, allowing it. To Seek Ben, but ben. in Layla, when Angle seeps ben. in, it's Angle at himself. Ben, it's the it's facade. It's the facade, but it's also supposed to give the impression that the facade could theoretically slip at any moment. It never does, but it's supposed to give an impression. It, it, it is the facade, but it's the, it really comes sure with an instability a... with it to some degree. I'm not actually sure it is a facade. I mean, I think it is the facade, but I don't think it's necessarily only the facade. I in some ways think it is kind of disassociative, which I think is maybe an accurate portrayal of what somebody in that situation might be like. Um, where the angle is in most of it lyrically it's and It's a facade, but I'm not life. saying it's necessarily a conscious facade. It's, it's an emotion, but it's a little bit of a contradictory emotion, I guess, in some way. I think it's like the subconscious. I mean, the, the use I mean, you, of can tell, you can tell by what he's saying in the lyrics that, you know, he's not hiding it. It's not a conscious yeah. facade. I. Yeah. But it is uh, kind of a different state than, you know, Mordor's Wage or something. It's like the emotion of Mordor. Of doing a mortal is being disassociated into two separate persona, where the dominant one ends up being just sad about it, or not even like deeply sad though, like disturbingly not sad, but still sad about it, like a loneliness, sort of like in Layla, 
Um, but much more sinister of that. Um, well, the compartmentalized angle that is actually the driving operative emotion is just like leaking through sometimes. So, in this sense, it is a facade, but it's not just a facade aimed at the world. It, the facade is like the outside of a building and it's not actually holding anything up. I think what's going on with the non-angry parts is holding quite a bit up. Um, it's just... Okay. I think okay. it's, it is, it's it is a like dominant you... reflection of the character's emotional state. It, it, is been, it is like you said, it is a wall, I guess. Not really a facade, but a wall, I guess. But it is deliberately... I assume, um, in the course of the song, it's musically meant to show... You know, it's the saying, but you could see the cracks in it. It could give way any moment. Yeah. There's an unease to it. I I mean, I think that that's... Uh, I think that's a yeah, correct interpretation of it. And I think in some ways this song is innovative in that way in the sense that it combines the psychedelia elements in places... No, it's definitely not psychedelic. So I mean, it incorporates the distorted guitar part and bits to convey anger and the emphasis on alienation through the guitar part. I think in some ways it's innovative. We'll get further into this as we discuss New Young, but I think that that's a um, I think that that's a I think that that's an important moment, even if it was not perceived. As that at the time, if you know what I mean. Yeah, well, speaking of um, conveying angle with the guitar and Neil Young, I, of course, also want to talk about perhaps one of the angriest songs I have ever heard, or perhaps one of the angriest guitars I have ever heard. More out and out angry, certainly, than the guitar on um, uh, Down by the River. One that is not even has an unease to one that is just out and out uh, an attack and outpouring of anger and frustration of the state of things. And that is, of course, Neil Young's Southern Man from uh, 1970s After the Gold Rush. Um, it's a very great song. It's a very politically and socially charged song. And the guitar throughout it, you have all this feedback, you have this whole attack, you have all this vitriol kind of aimed outwards in this song, you can really feel it in the guitar, and it is, I think, a really great song when it comes to how the guitar and the lyrics both kind of play together and kind of alternate, I guess, to some degree, at and at times work together to kind of, I guess, scream their message through, if you know what I mean. Yeah, I think Southern Man's guitar kind of plays two roles both sincerely, I guess. Um, the first role, in some ways, I think is conveying is the... is the sound of the, um... whole of slavery, in some ways. It's this kind of drawing thing where it's pulling, um kind of void out morally and I think that that's the dominant sound in the opening part um it's just this kind of drawing through history wall while in the when it he begins to pull into um the part where he's more discussing like when will you pay them back it's beginning to Transition from the kind of representation of just kind of this drawing out a moral calamity to representing the, his own anger and his own righteous disgust at it. And in some ways, it is playing this simultaneously. It's a very seamless transition and. I don't know what to say about it beyond that, that it's representing in the solo kind of that both. It's 
the violence against the slaves during segregation and stuff, but especially during slavery, come combined with a piano play, Paul, I think drawing it backwards, elongating it, and then it transitions into that more subtle Paul was like quiet all. And I think that walls walks in such a way as to pull it out and like elongate it. When the more aggressive ports represent even the violence of slavery or especially as the sun goes on, the violence of how he feels against people that perpetrated it and continued to perpetrate it at the time. And or continuing well, to about, perpetrate not slavery. It's about, it's about but, segregation, it's about lynchings, it's about the KKK. Yes, he has this the he, the violence in some ways of the slavery and the so lynching and the clan or being flipped back in his uh, sentiment of and Unfortunately, maybe not in real life. Uh, I have a clan and whatnot, but in his sentiment, at least, or being flipped back as the song goes on towards the perpetrators, um, while continuing to have this kind of this pulling back of sense of scale. Do, do you agree, Chris? Yeah, yeah, certainly I think it's one of the most, um, probably one of the angriest guitars I've ever heard in a song. It's very biting. As I said, it is very, very angry. And it is angry, it's a righteous angle at this, um, great in centuries-long injustice. Um, and it really is a very dark and foreboding song, and there's all this talk of violence in the song, um, and you can kind of hear it in the guitar walk, um, but it is being reflected back in some ways, as in, you know, you, you did all this stuff, you know, what, what's, what's, you know, and if you don't, you know, start changing your ways, you don't start, you know, making steps to pay them back, or, you know, make things right, then what's gonna happen to you? I mean, I I don't think Neil Young is critical of um, people that are attacking the clan. I don't think at all. No, 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 no. that's Some not what I'm saying. Seems... That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying he's saying it to to them. He's saying, yeah. you, the clan, you know, the people who are lynching, the people who are boarding crosses, you have done all this violent, you know, horrible, horrible stuff, and if you don't stop it, and if you keep going on this way... You know, you keep up, keep perpetrating this violence. That you know, what should happen to you? Well, yeah, we'll, we'll I mean, see. I think he makes very clear, both through lyrically and musically, that he views almost the attacking the clan, attacking racism in a violent. I mean, let's be honest, and equivalent manner as almost a religious duty. And I think the guitar and piano also help through their choices of style convey that, that there's kind of a southern white hypocrisy yes. of being like, oh, we're the most religious part of the country, yes. and we're so religious and sacred, and blah, blah, blah. While also, like, murdering a bunch of people and using the cross. Well, something, religious something, image something, and something, it in people's yards as a racist attack. Ben. Ben. He's flipping it back on that. Yes, something I didn't mention earlier is I said it's a very angry guitar. I say it has a very, you know, bite, you know, to it. Um, vitriol to it. Um, but it's not a, you know, fast, you know, floory sort of thing like uh, Layla's is. It is a, in some cases, you know, it has these sort of attacks, but they feel more focused, almost like shooting like a big cannonball or something. And it's got a very kind of, honestly, a slow old progression to it that sounds kind of like a march or even like a drum beat in some ways. It's a call to some degree to action. Um, it is meant to sound militaristic in some ways, but not in an organized militaristic way, but in a kind of protest in a march sort of way, but in a, 
you know, more militaristic than like a peaceful rally. And um, it's supposed to, I think, convey that. It's supposed to be a call to action, basically, to fight back. I mean, yeah, I think it is in some ways a violent song, but in, well, I mean, both in what it describes is happening and what it is wanting. And musically, too, yeah. Yeah, but I also think, yeah, it's important to know it's not j just violent angle that's the sound does this elongating of history, this almost spiritual element that then serves both as a spiritual right and as a spiritual justification of a spiritual right within the South, spiritual justification of his angle. The counterpoint of the longness of the history and of the violence and the quickness and the swiftness of his violence and that their crosses will be burning fast. It was meant to be oh, really less to some lie. degree. I mean, the sentiment is he's long-suffering, swift retribution, spiritual war versus spiritual redemption through violence. Uh... It's, I mean, it's a song in which the guitar Paul is playing contradictory roles between what has been done and what he thinks should come. That what he thinks will come, even if I uh, really hasn't come in the way that he's predicted in that song. Um. Yeah, I think that that's a good piece of guitar work. A quite excellent one. Yeah, um, there are a couple more of, um, Neil Young's songs I want to talk about. Um, the guitar notes on a Walk On, or I think, of course, some of, um, Neil Young's best as well from, uh, the On The Beach album, a very underrated album in some cases. Um, very good song. It's a bit more upbeat compared to the last couple of songs we talked about in terms of the sound. You know, it's a song that, you know, I guess all this bad stuff's happening around. You know, they'll say what they'll say and whatever, but in the end, you have to at least try to keep going. Um, but it's got a really great guitar tone throughout, I think. Um, and of course, the uh, different parts of the guitar, you know, the part where it's at the beginning, and then the part where it's like, doo -doo, doo -doo, you know kind of put way through. It goes through a kind of good variety of things. It has some range in there. It's overall, I think, a really great guitar song, Walk On by Neil Young. Um, and of course, the other kind of, I guess, um, I also want to discuss the other sort of main attraction of, I guess, Neil Young's guitar walk, which is, of course, the song Like a Hurricane, which has this very, um, very prominent even just some of the first few seconds, uh, sort of swirling, sort of, you know, omnipresent in a way, I guess, uh, electric guitar, a lot of, some feedback in there, you know, a good sort of sound throughout. It's, um, very, very unique sounding. I don't think there's anything that quite sounds like this song, like a hurricane. Um, the guitar work on it is really um, some of Young's best, and some of the best guitar work probably of all time, certainly of the 1970s. Um, it really is just a great, great song, Ben. What are your thoughts on Like a Hurricane? I think Like a Hurricane, I think, is also another excellent song. Um, just kind of a... And once again, blissfulness, that's the word that we keep on using. But um, also kind of a confusion, kind of a bending of what's going on yeah, this is... in the song. That happens over the long call of the song, but also the bending of the notes, the distortion of the notes. Even if it's it's not being used to convey angle here or like spacing out like in like a Hendrix or like a way that is like psychedelia or in a really angry aggressive way like in Southern Man it's being used in such a way that the bending and the distortion is acting 
in some ways, literally, it's literally distorting the emotion. It's adding ambiguity and uncertainty and bending a overall long term, I would say, bending throughout the song of emotional states being conveyed through how the guitar work is being done. Um, and it also just sounds good. I don't know yeah. what to say. As it I sounds said, good. A, it's very well of, as I said, there's a sort of swirling sort of sound to it, you know, like a hurricane. Um, and it's very kind of, in some cases, surreal sounding. It is um, a bit dreamy in places. It's a very odd sound, I guess, in a way. It is, I guess, in some ways kind of supposed to be, as I said, it sounds surreal. It's kind of uncanny valley, I guess, in a way as well, if we're not in the same kind of more mundane, threatening way as um, uh, Down by the River. But um, it's got this very nice... I'm still not exactly sure. I still haven't in my mind been able to make out exactly what makes this song tick. Um, I, of course, haven't reviewed it on my channel yet, um, but, um, it's a very great guitar song, it's got a, really, I think is one of the guitar songs of all time, even if it isn't really, I don't think, discussed as much as it really should be next to Clapton, Hendrix, Jimmy Page, um, etc. It really is... Just, I think some of the finest playing of all time, it's got kind of a musical weave to it. There's a little bit of a musical kind of guitar spell casting to it that really gives this kind of swirling, surrealistic feeling to it. It's kind of impressionistic in a way, I guess we could say. And I feel like um, that is quite impressive. Um, a couple of songs I want to mention, or is, I do want to mention. Um, the song Gwintolong from Decade, it's guitar is kind of, I guess, like the little brother of a, I guess, to, uh, like a hurricane. It's not, you know, as expertly done. It's not as, you know, prominent in some cases, but it is a very nice sort of, it has some similarities. Um, and of course, I do want to discuss then on Neil Young's more foreboding sort of sounding songs. Of course, Hey Hey My My Out of the Black and Hey Hey My My. In, out of the blue, um, those songs, of course, obviously have this very foreboding guitar sound as well, about, you know, and obviously they have a foreboding tone in general about death and dying, and of course, Out of the Black, of course, implements a whole lot of distortion. It's one of the most, I think, distorted at a guitar parts of the, you know, the probably 70s and 60s both. Um, you would get some stuff I think that was on poor with it in the 90s and maybe even in the 80s too I'm I guess a little bit less um you know I guess some of that stuff knowledgeable but it is one of the I guess heaviest uh uses of feedback in the 60s and 70s by that sort of generation the boomer and then the pre-boomer generation uh and ha you know the ones that kind of gave us the utilization of guitar feedback in music to begin with Um, yeah, I think in some ways, um, Lost Never Sleeps' the second side in particular is important in some, as kind of the, maybe not the only originator, but the most notable originator of kind of the use of guitar distortion and sort of guitar techniques to convey alienation social alienation or existential alienation a sort of meaninglessness of scenarios such as in Powerfinger um, that the guitar is working to solve not even just like an emotional purpose but almost a philosophical one if you know what I mean where it's like I don't know, the, I know the guy, and it's like, I don't know what I'm doing, well, what am I supposed to do here? And then he's dead. And the, and it's just kind of, bleh. the meaning in some ways is washed by that action. Not meaning 
in the song. The song could have quite a kind of bit of meaning, but meaning of that person is, or you know, that character is maybe not non-existent, but the meaning of the situ uh, throughout his life, in fact, it is quite implied, but the ending of that meaning in such a meaningless way, I think it's conveyed quite excellently through the, not only through the lyrics, but through the guitar work um, on that song, and just, I think that trends from that second half, um, but especially Powerfinger and um, My My Hey Hey, Into the Black, all continued on in 90s music, um, when you we have a, kind of a you really isolated, optimized generation to solve as the angle and confusion and stuff, which we have discussed in the previous yes, song, uh, ben, but in a more ben. existential way. Yes, well, I, I want to point out the influence of these songs on... 90s music and grunge and bands like Nirvana in particular, you could certainly, I think, hear a lot of um, Out of the Blue and Into the Black on songs like Come As You All and Lithium from Nevermind um, in sort of the kind of lumbering sort of way, I guess, uh, that it goes along with the feedback but with a bit of angle behind it, kind of a simmering in a way. Um, I love Neil Young's walk, I know, heavily influenced people like Kurt Cobain, and so, um, I just kind of want to comment on that. It did lead to, you know, it was a sound in the 60s and the 70s, but it led to being a very prominent sound kind of in the very early 90s as well because of its heavy influence on Kurt Cobain and Nirvana as well as other grunge bands and alt rock bands as well, of course. Uh, if I can add to that, um, Neil Young actually did an album with Pearl Jam as his backing band, I believe. And um, he also did an EP with Pearl Jam. And that EP led to Pearl Jam making No Code, which is, if you listen to it, it's very, very Neil Young inspired. Uh, I thought you were going to say something about Nirvana. Um, but yeah, <laughs> um, this influence clearly, yeah, on... Um bands like Pearl Jam as well. Honestly, a lot of the music of in that kind of time period of the art walk and grunge is very much inspired, at least in the way the guitar sounds, by what Neil Young was doing on songs like Southern Man and, um, of course, on West Devil Sleeps, the album. And um, it really did kind of come back and, you know, really kind of catch on though just briefly in the early 90s. Yeah, I mean, in some ways, West Neville Stapes, which draws on punk, and it draws on folk, and draws on a variety of different influences, um, and also Devo, um, ends up being, um, in some ways, the Bible of the Seattle scene, the kind of the template of the types of explorations that the Seattle scene that was and yet also became grunge um, did to understand in many ways reality and their meaning in life and their relation to the world um, despite Neil Young not ever explicitly preaching any messages on that, like he does a several man. I mean, I guess you could argue that he preaches better to burn out than it is to us. But otherwise, is and kind of a spirit of youthful rebellion, but otherwise he mostly just conveys it through his lyrics and his guitar work of kind of alienation and then rebellion against alienation and the kind of the Nietzschean construction of meaning but not with the other Nietzschean concepts attached so to speak it's not about the will to power the will to be you know the one who defines himself in a atomized sense of the ubermensch but it's still a kind of a reclaiming of the construction of meaning for 
communities of young people, a only but prescient reaction against the overall individualism that was building in number one the counterculture initially, but then later on into American conservatism, American liberalism, most ideologies in America, um, and in just cultural values that um, we kind of discussed on the Who Roundtable, but this is a almost existential response that goes beyond just what we were talking about on that Who Roundtable and goes to kind of questions of meaning in a way and in some ways questions meaning? Powderfinger, like I said, I think questions meaning quite a bit. Questions the meaning of death quite a bit. Yes. What um... was the point? But also in Hey Hey My My um, advocates for a construction of meaning through rebellion that I think um, is often in Bunge songs. Thank you everybody for watching. This ends part one of our series of Greatest Guitars of All Time, but we will have more parts coming up later as there are people we haven't yet to mention, such as Jimmy Page and Eddie Van Halen. If you all liked this video, I urge you to subscribe to my channel, as well as like this video, comment if you have something to say, and once again, thank you all for watching, I hope you have a great rest of your day.